This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the Weekly Top 3, our weekly podcast covering the top three things on our mind as we look ahead to the week of March 19, 2018. This week and for the foreseeable future, we will be doing the Weekly Top 3 as a segment on The Michael Duke Show. The Michael Duke Show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11. Instead of doing this as a monologue, I will be joining Michael on the show each Tuesday from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about the three issues. We will continue to post the podcast of our discussion following the show on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and on my website at bgkeithley.com. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you can follow and participate in the discussion with us of news and commentary on these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. You also can find past episodes of the weekly top three on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and again on my website at bgkeithley.com. This week, the top three issues we are following are these. First, what's going on with the state budget? Second, who is the Alaska Senate really protecting with its proposal to cut PFDs? And third, a discussion about President Trump's tariff policy and Alaska LNG. Now we join Michael for the discussion. Brad Keithley joins us, and uh, it's been a while, my friend, talking to you. Uh, uh, we've had chats every now and then, but just not being able to talk about the everything that's going on inside the uh, inside the uh, budget and stuff. What's uh, how are things been going? Well, they've been going fine. I've missed it. I uh, I've been doing a podcast uh, called uh, the weekly top the weekly top three in, in the meantime. And uh, and it's hard just to talk to yourself for for thirty minutes or so uh, uh, once a week. So I I welcome the opportunity to get back and be able to talk to you about it. Well, try try it two hours every day. It's fun. You like it. <laughs> you got. I guess you got. I guess you fall in love with the sound of your own voice. That's what happens. So it's all good. Uh huh. Well, well, I don't think I, I don't think my voice is is good enough to be able to follow. <laughs> so I, I I welcome the opportunity to be able to to, to get back. Uh, uh, under the uh, cover of the Michael Duke show. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you for coming on. And in fact, Brad was the first guy that I called when I uh, when I got things lined up to get started again. Brad was the first phone call I made, so I'm happy to have him back uh, on the program. Um, Brad, uh, I you know I've been I, I I will say it was a blessing and a curse uh, to be away for so long. It was a blessing in a way because I was able to uh, kind of unplug from politics. And you know sometimes that feels like you took a long hot shower. And you feel a little better, uh, and then, but then you got to come back, and you realize there's still work to be done. And uh, so we're jumping back into this. And you had some interesting discussions uh, in on your podcast, and and I know that there's been a lot of questions about what's going to happen. And part of those questions revolve around kind of the unknown quantity of our brand new senator uh, from out here, and that is Senator Mike Shower. He actually posted up something here a couple days ago talking about the size of the budget versus revenue and asking for suggestions. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think Senator Shower is a, is a breath of fresh air. Uh, he has the ability to sort of come in out of the cold, uh, sort of a Mr. Smith goes to Washington type deal, and, and take a fresh look at it. Uh, and I know he's immersed himself in, in trying to understand the budget, get his arms around the budget, see what uh, uh, opportunities there may be in the budget. Uh, since he got down there, he, he didn't join the caucus, and he sort of tried to do a deep dive straight into the budget. And his observations, I think, are are are, are a, a great way of sort of viewing what's going on down there. He had a post uh, about a week ago now on Facebook that I thought was extremely revealing. Uh, the post says the state has revenues of roughly 2.2 billion versus oil and gas royalties, fees, etc. The operating budget is roughly $4.5 billion. We're, we're two to three, $2.3 billion short of being able to pay our bills this year. We will take money from the earnings reserve to pay for the deficit. Do you see a problem? Of course, everybody sees a problem. Here's the key sentence in the next paragraph. 
the political ability to cut spending or even hold a flat budget from last year with a House, Senate, and governor who disagree, parens, with two of the three pushing for higher spending, close parens, is unlikely to happen this year. So what do we so what do we do? Want to hear your thoughts. But let's go back to that sentence. The political ability to cut spending or even to hold a flat budget from last year is unlikely to happen this year. <laughs> um, and that's that's a that's a guy who went down there with, you know, one purpose in mind, which is try to get the budget under control. And and I think he's exactly right. When when you look at at where things are um, uh, in terms of the spending levels the governor proposed, the spending levels now that the that the House Finance Committee has voted at or, and are going to be debated on the House floor this week. And frankly, you know, you listen to, to the rhetoric that's coming out of the Senate side. Senator Shower is exactly right. The political ability, the political will to cut spending or even hold a flat budget uh, is unlikely to happen this year. He's, he's exactly right. It's just... They've, they've run out of steam. The legislature, the governor have run out of steam making further cuts. They've gotten to the point now uh, where, you know, they may make a few more, but this group that we have down there just doesn't have the steam yet, the political, the steam remaining, the political will remaining to make, uh, to make significantly deeper cuts. So you end up you end up having to talk about new revenues. I mean, the, the Senate went there two years ago when they started talking about PFD cuts instead of cutting spending further. Uh, the governor that was with uh, that was with the bill that they had at the time. The governor followed through on that, cut the PFD uh, uh, when the when the that year's appropriations got to them got to him. Last year, uh, uh, neither the Senate nor the House uh, uh, made deep enough cuts to avoid uh, to avoid new revenues the senate you know, knee jerked back to cutting the pfd the house did as well the governor approved that and and the senate now sort of is taking taking pfd cuts as a given right and 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 moving on moving on from there so it's a I, this i i think i think the key takeaway is the group we've got down there if people if people are are wanting deeper cuts if they're wanting uh, to avoid having to go to new revenues, the group we got down there isn't going to do that. And Senator Shower, uh, I think, uh, I think his post was just was just an absolute revelation. When when people now on Facebook and elsewhere say, uh, "Oh no," when I when I talk about you know alternative new revenues, because because that's what we need. That's where we've been forced to go. That that's what we need to talk about. And and you and I can talk about it in the next segment. But but. When 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 I post stuff like that and people respond by saying, "Oh no, we have to cut the budget further," well, okay, but but Senator Shower, I mean, the guy who went down there with one goal in mind to do exactly that, recognizes the reality of it. So, okay, we can talk about that a lot, and we can tell ourselves, "Oh, there's more places to cut," and in fact, there are. Uh, but but the political will. Uh, just doesn't exist in the group we got down there right now to do it. Well, and they're living in kind of speculative land at this point. I mean, they're off in the pucker brush. Uh, there was a video up, I got a copy of it yesterday, where Andy Josephson admits on 360 North at one point that literally the budget can't be balanced without $98 a barrel oil. Who predicates a budget based on oil that is $20 higher than where it is right now? I mean, who, who even... Who even considers that a good idea? Well, apparently this government, it happened under Parnell, it's happened under Walker, it's happened under previous administrations, where they just say, well, this is our budget basing it on oil that, of course, we're never going to get to, but that's just how we're going to do it. I mean, it's crazy what's going on. Yeah, and we've gotten to a situation, Michael. I mean, we were in this situation roughly from 2006 forward it sort of it sort of went into hyperdrive in 2010 2011 forward we've gotten into a situation where special interests go down to juno and they say yeah 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 i know we got a fiscal crisis yeah 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 i know we're i know we're, we shouldn't be spending this much but my program is special <laughs> and and you and, and you need to spend on my program yeah cut all those other guys but my program is special and you get that from K through 12. You get that from Medicaid. You get that from from they, they, they're getting it in spades right now from the construction industry. I mean, you get it you get it from a lot of different angles. And 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 there's no 
person down in in the group we've got down there right now. There's no person there who's cutting through that and saying, "Yep." But guess what? The fiscal crisis is more important than any of that. Right. And and we've got to we got to do something to get spending down a whole lot more uh, down to long term sustainable levels. We got to do we got to cut spending down to, to we, we, that that's more important than anything else. There's nobody down there. Well, there are some in the house, a few in the house, handful in the house, and Senator Shower maybe. Uh, but there's there's nobody in control down there who takes dealing with the fiscal crisis is the highest priority. Everybody else has got, um, uh, a, 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 you know, I've, we've got to do K through 12. We can't cut through K through 12. We've got to do Medicaid. We can't cut Medicaid. Uh, we've got to do the university. Heck, we've even got to increase the university by 19 million. We've run out of, we've run out, not only run out of room, run out of steam to cut the university anymore, we can't even hold the line anymore. We're going to, we're going to start going back up. There's, there's, there's all these little um, special interests uh, that, that go down there and go down for a single shot and have enough, have enough uh, uh, ability with their lobbyists and, and the ability to bring people down there to sort of, you know, uh, uh, outrun the fiscal, the fiscal crisis. Right. There's no person that goes down. There's no person, there's no interest that goes down there and says, Hey, the fiscal crisis is the most important thing. Start with solving that. And then we'll back into how much we can allocate to everybody else. Right. It, it, it operates in the reverse. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's not zero base budgeting at all. It is how much can we spend? And then, well, how do we pay for it all? Uh, you know, and that that's, uh, of course, that reverse discussion. And you and I have had that talk before yesterday. Again, I was lamenting the fact that the permanent fund has got a pretty good mechanism for payout as the five-year rolling average of the revenues of the fund is actually what formulated. And I advocated that that's what we need to do with the state. Take a five-year rolling average of the revenue, and that's the revenue. That's what we get for this year. And if we have a good year, then it goes up just a little bit. If we have a bad year, it goes down just a little bit. But that five-year rolling average is a pretty good idea of what we're going to do instead of this pie in the sky. What do you want? Let's do it. And then how do you pay for it? We have no idea. Yeah, the Senate The Senate says the Senate majority would tell you they're coming up with a solution for that, which is their spending cap. Uh, it's all and, smoke and, and mirrors. Develop this spending cap. It's, huh? it's all smoke and mirrors. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing binding in that. That's like saying, "Oh, we feel like it. We're going to do it." They're not. I mean, it's not even. It'll hardly even be statutory. If you want something like that, you're going to have to put it in the Constitution. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, that's that's the. I I I, I chuckled when I when I saw them starting to push that. I mean, that's the that's the whole meaning of the Supreme Court's decision. Uh, in the permanent fund dividend case, right, right, it, and, and it is, and it is that that you can't bind the legislature on fiscal matters by statute. You can't. I mean, they can just they they can just ignore it. So they ignore the ninety day rule. That's not a fiscal matter, but they ignore it anyway. You, they ignore they ignore the ninety day uh, uh, limit on the on on the legislative session. They ignore the PFD statute, which says you shall. I mean, we have a statute that says you shall, and they ignore that. Right. And so when they start talking about, oh, we're going to have this statutory spending cap, that's just ludicrous. It won't even last this session. Much, right. Much it's... less you know, any, any future sessions. Yeah, no, it's all political theater at that point. But you actually did some deeper analysis, which I found very interesting, on what the Senate is actually doing. I mean, we talk about who are we protecting, who are we doing, are we looking out for the people? Oh, we're your champions. Oh, we'll draw the line in the sand with no taxes and everything else and yet you did some deeper analysis over here on the senate that if i mean if this really came out this is this is some shame-faced stuff as far as i'm concerned no it is i so i did a piece yesterday uh that, that's titled just who is the alaska senate majority trying to protect and you can find it uh on on one of my blogs where you can find the best way to find is on the alaska for sustainable budgets uh, uh facebook page and it and it and it and it started out. I was reading an article in the, in the Anchorage Daily News, written by Nat Hertz, uh, on Sunday, uh, talking about the new uh, state revenue forecast uh, that uh, ha predicts a, 
it uses higher prices finally that finally catching up uh, with the, with the reality that's going on in the oil markets. And when you use higher oil prices, then revenues go up and it, and it reduces the deficit by a little bit, not certainly not enough to offset the spending levels we're at, but it reduces it by a little bit. But what I found in Nat's article, just, just of significant interest was a comment where he's trying to summarize uh, the Senate majority's uh, current position uh, on fiscal matters, on, on what you do about new revenues. Uh, since you can't cut spending enough, what, what kind of new revenues you're going to come up with? And and it, the, the, the piece said, the Senate majority favors lower uh, permanent fund dividends. Senate leaders have said taxes would hurt Alaska's economy and aren't needed. And that's just I, – I, I just sort of you know exploded at the paper when I read that. Oh, yeah. The, the, that's just – if you really were concerned about the Alaska economy and, – and it says Senate leaders have said taxes would hurt Alaska's economy and aren't needed. If you really were concerned about Alaska's economy, you wouldn't be doing what they're doing. You'd be doing the exact reverse. Right. The ICER study, you know, the ICER study in 2016 said – concluded, quote, the PFD cut – the PFD cut has the largest adverse impact on the economy, close quote, of all the, so, of all the new revenue sources they analyzed. So in terms of what had the largest adverse impact on the, on the economy, and this is what you know, the Senate leader said that, that's driving their agenda, what has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy? The PFD cut. Right. Taxes, taxes have a less impact on the overall economy. Uh, overall, on the overall economy. So, if if you're really concerned, like the Senate claims, about the economy, uh, then PFD cut would be the last thing you would pull. It would also be the last thing you you would pull if you if you were concerned about Alaska families. ICER did an analysis in early 2017 about what's the impact of of the various alternatives on Alaska families. Concluded, the PFD cut would be by far the costliest measure for Alaska families. Taxes come secondary to that. So if you're concerned about Alaska families, the PFD cut is the last lever uh, you want to pull. And then one other thing that, that, I've, that I've, I've thought about for a while, but frankly had not written about and not analyzed in as much detail uh, before this past weekend, before I saw that article. But, but when you look at the PFD cut, it comes entirely out of Alaskans' pockets. Right, right, right. Only Alaska residents get the PFD, so they're they're the only ones that are paying this new revenue source through through a through a PFD cut. When you look at taxes, and and I look at flat taxes a lot, and and I have to defend that a lot, but I I look at flat taxes as an alternative. When you look at when you look at taxes, you reach not only income from Alaska that are going into Alaska residents' pockets, you also reach income. Uh, or if you want to use the sales tax sales uh, sales that are that are being made by outsiders, right. like either either income being earned from Alaska sources by by non-residents, or purchases being made in Alaska by non-residents, and so you broaden the base and you lessen uh, the amount that has to be collected from Alaskans. Right. Say you want to raise a hundred dollars, if if you want to raise a hundred dollars. Um, on the on the PFD because that money is only in Alaskans' pockets. You have to raise the full hundred dollars from Alaskans. If if you if you do it through a tax, however, you only have to raise ninety two, ninety three, ninety dollars, a little bit less than ninety dollars from Alaskans. The rest of it comes from outsiders. So a PFD cut, it going down that road as your as your fiscal alternative costs Alaskans over ten years. I calculated five hundred million dollars, half a billion dollars more than if we used uh, an alternative measure, uh, a, a tax that would, that would raise some of that, some of that money, that $500 million, that half a billion dollars from, from outsiders. So the Senate says they're concerned about the economy, but they picked the, the exact approach that has the largest adverse impact on the economy, is the, by far the costliest for Alaska families, and cost Alaskans five hundred million dollars more over ten years uh, than than any alternative. Uh, the Senate, they're not concerned about the economy. Whatever the heck else they're concerned about, and I speculated in the article, but whatever the heck else they're concerned about, it's not the economy. Because if you were going to be concerned about the economy, you would be cutting the PFD last uh, instead of first. <laughs> 
Right. Well, and we look at this, Brad, and and I I don't mind you getting into the speculation as to what was happening because you point out really quickly that if you start looking at some of these other taxation schemes, like a flat tax, and for example, and you look who is actually being protected, and I think this is a whole follow the money kind of thing. You look at it, you sh- it shows that those that are being protected are those that are making a hundred and eighty, a hundred and ninety thousand dollars a year. Those are the ones that are making. Right. Those are the ones that are being protected by cutting the PFD versus those who would be, you know. So it's the top ten percent. Yeah, exactly right. I, you can you can do the you can do the math. It's it's a it's a math equation. You can you can find the crossover point uh, of where uh, a, I used a flat tax, a flat tax of two point five two point six percent, which would or two point six five percent, which would raise the same amount of revenue as the Senate says they need through a PFD cut. You can you can do the math and see at the crossover point, the point at which a, a flat tax at that level would take more from an Alaska family than the PFD cut. And, and below that crossover point, uh, uh, families that are below that crossover point are better paying a flat tax, better off paying a flat tax than they are a PFD, than they are suffering a PFD cut. They save more, they keep more in their pocket. Um, they have more to spend in the Alaska economy uh, below that crossover point from a PFD cut. Uh, it's only when you get above that that crossover point uh, that, a, that a flat tax takes more than a PFD cut. And And even I, you know, off the top of my head, I thought that, I thought that crossover point was going to be about a hundred thousand dollars. Turns out it's one hundred and sixty to one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Those below that price, those with family income below that level, are better off uh, if the if the if the new revenue option the the legislature uses as a flat tax. They're better off. They pay less. Less comes out of their pocket uh, under a flat tax. It's only when you cross above that level. Uh, that a flat tax is going to is going to is going to cause you to pay more, and it's not really that much more. So what the Senate, you know, is the Senate's not really worried about the economy. <clears throat> when you boil it down and you do the analysis, who the Senate's really trying to protect, who they're really concerned about, uh, is the is the top ten percent. Uh, of Alaska families. They're not concerned about the bulk of Alaska families. They're not concerned about the overall Alaska economy. They're not concerned about keeping as much money in the state uh, 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 as, as, as you possibly can. They're concerned about the top 10% uh, of, uh, of, of the income bracket. And that's, that's what's driving this whole effort by the Senate to, to focus on the PFD cut uh, as opposed to uh, uh, look at alternative revenue measures. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm sort, of, I'm sort of stunned by it. I mean, I, I knew that that the that the Senate was responding to their donor class, responding to 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 that that portion of the of the economy or that portion of their <clears throat> of their constituency that doesn't want to pay taxes. But I didn't realize it was that high. Well, and it, it is an eye opener, and it makes you wonder. One of the things that hit me in this article that Nat Hers you've been referring to about the new revenue is just kind of this blase like acceptance that the dividends that are a new lower level. It's like nobody even wants to discuss the possibility of what's going on uh, with it, other than the, the the house wants to crow that they're willing to give you a slightly higher dividend than the than the Senate is, of course. You know, fifty dollars more. Yeah. Instead of your. <laughs> You know, which I mean, God, that's a boon. Thank you so much for wanting to give me more of my money back. Um, but that was really the tone of this whole thing. Really, was just driving me crazy. That it's just like it's a done deal. This lower, this lower amount is you're just going to look at it for the rest of your life. That's what's going on, and uh, it, it's just yeah, frustrating. That's why we. That's that's how I got into this. That's how that's how Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets got formed. That's how that that's what drives this. I mean, it's it's. It's what's in the best interest of the overall economy. So the Senate's rhetoric is right. I mean, it should be about what's in the best interest of the overall economy and what's in the best interest uh, of Alaska families. Their rhetoric is right. Their goal is right. But they're not doing things that live up to it. I mean, they're doing things. It's like they've hijacked. It's like what the governor did with the concept of sustainable budgets, right? They hijacked the language. They hijacked the phrase. 
but they don't they don't live up to it. They go off and do something else right. under this cover of of saying we're worried about the economy, we're worried about Alaska families. They go off and they worry about the top ten percent. They right. do things that benefit the top ten percent and leave the other ninety percent out 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 floating in the wind and leave the overall economy out floating in the wind. Right. It's uh, it's very frustrating. And I think it's telling. uh, And it reminds us that, hey, this election season, 50 of the 60 legislators are up for reelection. And we may want to look into that. You know, that just that just might that just that's what's going to happen. You know. Yep. Well, that's where we're going with this bunch. As long as we keep this bunch uh, in uh, in this governor and and these legislators down in Juneau shower. Jower's point is perfectly correct. We're just not going to do anything different. This is where we're going. This is where we're going to stay at. You want to change it, we need to change the group the, the group that's down there. Yep. If we don't change the group that's down there, we're going to keep going down this direction. Absolutely. Uh, we uh, Brad Keithley is our guest <clears throat> from the Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. You can check that out. I've got links up in the chat right now for you to go follow his Facebook page. While uh, we were on hiatus, he was doing his own podcast, and he had his weekly three. So we've done two of the three, and this is his weekly top three. So the third story, though, takes us kind of more on a national, international level level it takes a little bit uh, of a look at Alaska LNG let's talk about that yeah so I I've been following LNG I when you look at what's in Alaska's future what what could be a game changer in terms of making things significantly better than worse uh, the LNG project is out there I know people argue against it that you know it's not going to work out that it's spending too much money But in terms of what's out there in front of us, that's the big game changer out there. So if we can make it work, we should. And so I follow it fairly closely. One of the the really fascinating things that's going on right now is what the Trump administration is doing about tariffs. Uh, Last week, they announced a 25% tariff on steel. Uh, And if you you listen to Governor or Senator Murkowski uh, and Senator Sullivan, they were upset about that because – uh, it would it would have the potential of raising the cost of the steel used in uh, the AKLNG project. A, a valid concern. Uh, you can't get the size pipe. Uh, n- n- no U.S. plant makes the size uh, pipe that would be used in the AKLNG project. It has to come uh, from a foreign plant. No U.S. plant can retool for it. It'd be too expensive. It has to come from a foreign plant. And so, and so that 25% tariff that that Trump's talking about on steel would have a significant impact. This week, it's really getting a little wild. So this week, uh, uh, Trump announced yesterday $60 billion uh, in new tariffs uh, directed toward China, directed toward Chinese goods. And you can see a lot of bad things going on in that. You can see a trade war starting out between (laughs) China and the U.S. that would have an impact uh, have an adverse impact on the export of U.S. goods to China uh, in the same way that Trump's trying to put a block or a cost on Chinese imports to the U.S. You can see right. tit for tat sort of sort of quickly getting out of hand. I think there's – but but if you, really, if you really pay attention to what's going on, if you really understand what Trump's trying to do, if you follow his rhetoric and you follow the rhetoric of Wilbur Ross and others in the administration that have been pushing these – what they're really trying to do is resolve a huge trade imbalance between the, the U.S. and China. The U.S. imports a heck of a lot more uh, from China than China imports from the U.S. And really what all these tariffs are about uh, is to try to get that trade imbalance down, not necessarily through these tariffs. Uh, that's, sort of the, that's sort of the tool that they're using to try to pry the Chinese government uh, into getting focused on on leveling the playing field in terms of their exports to the U.S. and U.S. exports to China. To cut to the chase, they want the Chinese to increase their imports uh, from the U.S. to offset the, the value of the imports coming into the U.S. from uh, from China. What are the big What are the big things that China could import that would, would that would make huge steps in restoring? Uh, in, in offsetting that trade imbalance, energy, oil, and natural gas. The Chinese already are importing oil from the U.S. Interestingly enough, uh, we just started. At, we just we just lifted our export ban on oil uh, a few years ago, and already uh, we're the second largest supplier. U.S. oil is already the second largest supplier uh, into China. 
we don't have a lot of LNG going into China. We have had one cargo come out of the Gulf Coast and go into China, uh, but we don't have a lot of LNG going into China. If the Alaska project came to fruition and it exported to China, that would make a big difference uh, in the trade imbalance. So, yeah, this tariff war is not going to be fun. It's not going to be a good thing. As I said yesterday, I don't want to be a soybean fire. Uh, farmer right now because the, the <laughs> biggest market for soybeans, U.S. soybeans, is China. And and th- in this tit for tat, that'll be the first thing I would think that the Chinese are going to lash out at. But if you look through what the administration's trying to get at, and if you uh, if if you think, and and I think and I think they will find some resolution. If you think there's going to be some resolution, one of the big beneficiaries out of that uh, is going to be energy exports from the U.S. to China. LNG could be a major part of that. The Alaska project is perfectly situated to do that. So I, I think I think there's a I think there's a curiously enough out of out of a mess that that we're creating by starting this trade war. I think there's a path to uh, to improved opportunity for the Alaska LNG project. And I you know frankly I'm sort of excited to see where this goes. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, and uh, we're talking about oil, gas, budgets, and more. Yesterday I had a conversation about China with uh, Senator Shelley Hughes. Um, and, I mean, I have some concerns just based on the regime there and some of the changes that have been going on. And, and uh, the uh, FT have, uh, had a really good uh, article about the rise of, uh, of Xi Ping and, and what he's been doing in China, and that there were some disturbing trends in there. And I wonder... What are your thoughts on the political ramifications of Alaska working so closely with China and this regime that is, um, what seems to be slipping back more towards some Maoist tendencies rather than kind of open capitalism? Yeah, it, it's not perfect. The, the Chinese aren't perfect politically, and it's uh, and and yes, we wish they would be uh, from a from a human rights standpoint and other standpoints, we wish they would be better. But from a market standpoint, they're the they they are the the they and India are the two biggest emerging markets on LNG. If you're going to have an LNG project that works, it's going to have to sell um, uh, into China. That's what the Gulf Coast projects, LNG projects, which frankly are our competitors, that's what the Gulf Coast LNG projects are focused on. That's what the Australian LNG projects have been focused on. Uh, that's what that's what the, the Russian LNG projects have been focused on getting into China. So if you if you want to have the prospect of of LNG sales, if you see that as something that 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 we want to do, China is a necessary piece of that. Uh, and frankly, frankly, I'm fine with Chinese investment in Alaska to bring that project about. If the Chinese invest here um, and and put capital in the ground here, uh, they're not going to run away from this project. If we if we say, oh no, we can't take Chinese investment, that's bad. Uh, we don't want Chinese investment. We'll fund it some other way. If the Chinese don't have capital here, then then their incentive to continue to purchase here if things ever get rough. Is going to be relatively low because they right. don't have anything at risk. Right. If they put capital in the ground here, um, uh, not only do we have a tie to their markets in, they have they have capital here that they want to make sure gets utilized. That's that's a good that's a in the business world that's a good trade. We do the United States for good or bad does trade in the world, and and not all of the world are good people. Right. <laughs> the, right. the UK. The UK and the European Union only have so much demand. If we're gonna find a market for these things, uh, China is going to have to be China is going to have to be uh, part of the game. So, yeah, not perfect human rights, but it's sort of like that. It's sort of like that that proposal that that Senator Wilikowski tried to run in the Senate yesterday to direct the permanent fund not to invest in Russia anymore. I, it, you, you can make a lot of money in Russia. Do we not want the permanent fund now to have the opportunity uh, to make money by investing in companies that 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 are doing legal things in in, in legal ways? Uh, I, if we're going to make money, we're going to have to deal with some with some less than perfect actors in the world. China is one of them, 
and uh, and and I think we ought to be doing that. Uh, that actually is a good segue to my other question here. Harold is writing in the chat room and he talking about Russia specifically, and he said Russia is exporting directly from their Arctic coast. Why would Alaska try and sink sixty five billion into a pipeline if Russia is just exporting right there off the coast themselves? I mean, what would be the uh, what would be the uh, I guess attractiveness of that versus you know working directly with their northern neighbors, Russia? Well. I, Russia has LNG. Alaska has LNG. You never want to put all of your eggs uh, in one basket. The Chinese don't want to put all of their eggs in one basket. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, Russia, things could go wrong in Russia and dry up that source. You wouldn't want to be entirely committed to Russia. Diversification uh, is important in any uh, energy resource. So there are reasons why the Chinese uh, want to deal with Alaska. Now, do we ultimately come to a deal? Uh, between us and the Chinese, I don't know, uh, uh, but the but you can see how the economics could work. Uh, I think the Trump administration's trade war, as as bad as economists are going to think that is, um, uh, sort of loosens up the game in a way that, that that sort of increases the possibility of being able to bring it together with the Chinese uh, as the Chinese try to try to deal with uh, with the trade imbalance. Um, I think I think we just ought to. I, I think we keep moving ahead with the LNG project. Keep our eyes on what's going on out there um, and look for opportunities. Because again, if you look on the on Alaska's horizon, that's one of the big positives that are out there. You take that off the table, um, uh, and uh, and and I think I said to you at one point a couple of years ago when something had happened, that's the day the music died. I, I, yeah. I'm not sure there's anything else out on the uh, out there on the Alaska horizon that's as big as LNG. Yeah, no, and I, and I would agree with that. I mean, there's got to be some future, and we got to find a way to make it, you know, affordable and feasible. And that's always been the problem here. We're down to the last ten minutes or so here, Brad. And I think what a lot of people out there are uh, are feeling. Um, Frustration. I mean, tremendous frustration. For example, last week we had the testimony about the, or we had the discussion about HJR 23, which is the House's, uh, you know, attempt to constitutionalize the rate of the permanent fund, essentially. And they received scathing, blistering testimony from everybody in the audience. Uh, it was like 95, 97 percent of the audience uh, testimony uh, opposed. And yet in the end, they voted and said, you just didn't understand what we were discussing. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I think that that just I mean, that is a that is a perfect picture of the frustration factor of the Alaskan people right now. What are your thoughts on what we as citizens can do um, as we move forward on this to try and fix this? Because, I mean, this thing, if that's how they're going to treat us, I mean, the Peter Machicki saying we wouldn't put the PFD amount vote up to a vote because people would vote with their pocketbooks. Well, wait a second. Of course we would. And then, well, you just didn't understand what you were voting on. That's or what you were testifying on. That's what. But we're going to vote to keep you safe. We're going to vote to protect you, you little boy and girl. You're going to be fine. We're going to take care of you. How do we deal with that? Uh, we got to change the players in in, in Juneau. I mean, uh, we either do or we don't. If 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 we're going to change the direction, I think shower. I think Senator Shower's post, frankly, is a wake up call on this. If we're going to change the direction, we got to change the players in Juneau. If we don't change the players in Juneau, if we either decide we don't want to or there's not of a motive enough votes to do it, uh, we're going to keep going down the same track. We're going to keep talking about uh, not cutting enough. We're going to need new revenues. And then the debate's going to turn to, to, to what the new revenues are going to be. Um, and, and, and again, I think it ought to be flat tax, but we're going to have that debate about what the new revenues ought to be. Uh, and the Senate's going to keep pushing, the, this current Senate's going to keep pushing for PFD cuts because that, that responds to their donor class. Um, we've, got to change the, we've got to change the people in Juneau. We've got to, we've got to find, uh, we've got to vote for a new governor. If you, if, you want, if you want something to be different, you've got to change the players. We've got to, we've got to have a new governor. And frankly, we got to have new senators um, uh, and new House members. But the Senate was the Senate said we're going to be the ones that protect you. We're going to be the line in the sand. We're not going to let spending get out of hand. We're going to keep costs under keep spending under control. And they haven't. So if you want costs under control, you got to change the people uh, to, who who are allowing costs to, to spending to to stay out of control. Right. And that you, you, there, there's opportunities. You got Mia Costello. 
uh, in West Anchorage. You've got Peter Machecki, uh down in Kenai. You've got uh, 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 Click Bishop and Pete Kelly uh, up in Fairbanks. There's people who are running for re-election who could be defeated uh, by by others who uh, who want to uh, get spending under control. But you've got to do it, or else uh, or else we're just going to keep going down the same road. Absolutely. And and uh, somebody just asked me a question. They said, "Do you?" So are you two in favor of giving Walker and the legislature a blank check to rock the PFD to support the LNG? That's crazy. That's not what we said. Um, uh, I just want to be clear. I think that gas is the future of Alaska as far as future revenues and where we're going. It's the only bright spot on the horizon for us um, as far as future revenues down the road. But I definitely don't support the governor raiding the permanent fund or giving the legislature a blank check. Those guys need to go. Yeah, no, I, I I agree. We're a long way from from identifying how we're going to finance this pipeline. The the Walker administration's proposal right now, the the deal they the preliminary deal they did with the Chinese says the Chinese finance seventy five percent of it. Seventy five percent of of forty billion dollars is thirty billion dollars. Um, uh, that leave, would leave ten billion dollars, and and I think the I think the majors. Uh, you, one one thing people assume is that the majors are off the table, the producers are off the table. They don't want any part of this project. I don't think that's accurate. If this project starts going where they can monetize their resource at a price that that uh, that they think is attractive, um, uh, they're going to be part of this project, and they're going to want to they're going to want to have some control over it. And some control means they're going to have to put some dollars on the table. So I think we're a I think we're a long way away. From from seeing the finance package, the ultimate finance package is going to come together on this, and and I don't think it takes, uh, I don't think it involves PFD or permanent fund dollars. And I don't, I hope it doesn't involve retirement pers and ters retirement dollars, as Walker suggested at some point. I think we see a financing package if it goes. I think we see a financing package that makes uh, that makes a lot more sense. Brad Keithley is our guest uh, with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Apparently, the Facebook stream just crashed. I don't know exactly what happened, but I just got notification that the stream ended. So we're still streaming out uh, on the website at michaeldukeshow.com. We're just finishing stuff up. And, of course, you'll get a chance to listen to this whole thing and Brad's closing thoughts here uh, if you download it as a podcast. So, Brad, let's let's get to it. Fifty legislators, a governor. Uh, that's really where we make the difference when this is all said and done. Your final thoughts here as we wrap it up. Well, uh, it, it, we're going to come up to a choice. And, and frankly, you and I have been talking about this for a couple of years. We're going to come up to a choice in this election. Do we keep going down the road we're going down, which is uh, high spending levels and and the need to come up with significant new revenues uh, and and sort of down the road we're going, cutting the PFD in order to make up those new revenues, or do we change course? Um, and and change course means you change governors. Uh, Mike Dunleavy is the one that's out there talking right now about about the things that would change the course significantly, reduce spending uh, through his use of, of the veto, uh, preserve the PFD. Um, uh, do we change course like that uh, and and elect a new legislature to support that effort? That's that's what we're coming up to, and that's you know frankly everything we talk about. Uh, during during 2018 is going to is going to come back to that point. Do we change course or not? If we don't change course, then we need to be talking about what the source of new revenues is. PFD cuts or or uh, uh, or uh, uh, a flat tax or or some other source of new revenues because we we can't afford the spending that we're on. We, we're going to have to have new revenues, or do we change course? That's that, that's basically what we're coming to in 2018. Well, um, we're going to have to do it. And otherwise, I mean, I was saying it yesterday. I think that we're I think we're coming up on that 12, 18 month window where if we don't straighten out the ship now, it'll be too late when we see the rocks down the road, quite honestly. Uh, And between that and the fact that the U.S. economy is just, I mean, a runaway for 20, 21 trillion dollars and our (laughs) and our debt is growing at 34 percent faster than our than our GDP. I mean. When when you've got a thirty six percent when your debt is growing thirty six percent faster than your overall economy, you've got a problem, and it's and if you don't fix it, yeah. something's going to happen. Yeah, that's that's going to be a that's going to be a discussion you and I are going uh, you and I, a segment you and I are going to talk about down the road. That is a huge problem, uh, and and frankly, the Trump administration's made it worse. People don't want me to say that, but it's true. I mean, between the 
the tax reform that that really wasn't tax reform and uh, and the additional spending package they piled on top of that the trump administration's made it worse so uh we, we've got to get it under control there are things that dan sullivan lisa murkowski and don young can do about that we'll talk about that in a future program but yeah we got we got a whole lot of we got a whole lot of issues out there um and if we but, but the but again coming down to the final point if we keep the same play the same people in place uh to deal with those issues we're going to end up we're going to end up going right down the track we're on we've got to if we want to change that track we need to change people all right brad keithley alaskans for a sustainable budget appreciate you coming on board and talking with us today well that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from alaskans for sustainable budgets our thanks to Michael Dukes for allowing us to come on his show and do our segment there. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on our Facebook and Twitter pages. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.